I started working on the film before production began. I was a small child, <laughs> living with my parents' guest house. Hi, I'm Don Sylvester. I'm the supervising sound editor for Ford vs. Ferrari. I'm David Giamarco. I was a re-recording mixer and a sound editor on Ford vs. Ferrari. Today, we're going to be breaking down how sound works in film and how we use it to tell a story. I like to describe sound, at least movie sound, as a, a tree of sound. It has three main branches, dialogue, music, and sound effects. But inside those branches, or below those branches, are extensions of different kinds of sound. Dialogue has got production sound and ADR, added sound later. Music has got score and source music. Sound effects has got a whole lot of different branches, foley, backgrounds, atmosphere, hard effects. There's a whole lot of different sound editors each one cutting different things in different locations. The difference between a sound editor and a sound mixer is the sound editor will assemble the sounds and cut them, and there may be more than one sound editor, there could be 10, and each person then will be responsible for a certain aspect of the sound, not all the sound. The sound effects editor will compile sounds, go out and record sounds, put sounds together to picture. At a point when the film is ready to show, we're gonna have to mix these together. Only at that point do these three elements come together in a room like this. They are then put together in a sort of a recipe that the mixer will then be the controller of the flavors of those sounds. And then he'll feature one sound over another. The music may be stronger here, or the sound effects may be stronger here. That recipe then is, is in his hands. And as a mixer, he'll then control the overall soundtrack of the film. So sound mixing is bringing dialogue, music, and sound effects to a room like this. We play through the reel and balance and mix so that they play and balance well against one another. A sound supervisor oh, will be hired me. on a show. He will put a crew together and he works closely with the director. They'll speak about the vision of the, of the film and what kind of sound the director wants for the movie. And then we'll start putting a soundtrack together. Uh, I was brought on the film early to work on what we call a previs. Previs is an animated rendition of the scene made by computers. It's kind of a, a, a moving storyboard. And the director comes in and directs it. They felt that they needed sound. I agreed, they had to have sound to have the cars have any kind of impact on the screen. I came in to make all the sounds for the animated previs so that he could help figure out what he's gonna actually do on the day when it actually came to recording the cars. And so as my job is to get that stuff realized. In this case, being fortunate enough to work with him four times, it was great to be able to kind of anticipate where he's going to go just because of previous knowledge from earlier films. Once dialogue, music, and effects are in a good place, then we all come here to the stage. It's only then we can judge whether they're gonna work well together in this environment. That's what Dave does, he'll, he'll mix it together. The director will then now be able to hear everything for the first time in this room. It's been all acoustically treated and we can create a theater environment in here. It's really remarkable that some of the hard work that you go into making sound gets in this room and it's not good enough. And then we have to go back and redo it because it, it reveals the true sound. That's why everything that comes out of this room sounds great, because we've been there and we've now heard everything we need to hear and we fixed it. Well, now let's look at some clips on the mixing stage. In the beginning of the movie, Carol Shelby talks about how a man becomes one with a machine. Here's an example of where the man becomes part of the race, the machine. He's thoroughly concentrating on his race. And although it's a very intimate moment, it's snapped out when reality comes back and the car in front of him does an evasive uh, maneuver. So what is an internal moment? It's probably when the sound goes away. So not only is it important when the sound's there, but it's also the lack of sound. And we get to focus on other sounds that are not the race sounds. His breaths, there's a kind of a drone going on which represents what we hope is an internal moment. This is a lack of sound that makes the next sound more impactful. So in order to try to achieve some kind of the realism of racing in an open cockpit like this, we had this heavy buffeting wind. Which also gives way to the design effects that 
is all around us in the room in Atmos, and I can play that with the car. This is the Dolby monitor that allows us to see where I'm placing things in the room. Like those balls light up when program is hitting them and that's where I place the wind in the room. It's up closer to the screen up on top. It gives me a view of where I've placed things and what's hitting things when and where. Practical effects like the when the car crashes and comes flying by us, that I'm using Atmos to take us through the room as the car would uh, go over us. Nice move from 10 miles. 22 laps remaining. Of course, the car crash comes flying over our heads. Let me just show you what music and dialogue we're doing through that same sequence. 22 laps remaining with Bill Hill and Dan Gurney in the lead. So these tracks here all make up Ken's car. These are the other race cars on the track. From here down is tire suspensions, brake squeaks, squeals, and things like that. You know, there's a lot of elements playing here. We can't play them all. Uh, engines and backgrounds and crowds and things like that. Some feet. You're not gonna hear feet in this scene. Ah, we can hear the feet in the Ford scene where Henry Ford II talks about getting people to work for him. In 1899, my grandfather, Henry By God Ford, was walking home from Edison Illumination after working a double shift. He was ruminating. That morning, he had himself an idea that changed the world. In this clip, uh, Henry Ford addresses the employees of Ford Motor Company, and the voice needed to have the same impact as his personality. We wanted to make sure his voice boomed throughout the factory. It's actually heavily treated. I don't think you'll notice that it's heavily treated because it sounds right for the man and it sounds right for the environment. So this is how he initially sounded. In 1899, my grandfather, Henry By God Ford, was walking home. So then we add that verb to him to carry through the plant. In 1899, my grandfather, Henry By God Ford, was walking home. We also felt that the feet, that his feet walking, would also express some of his personality. Things need to have character, and they need to have more than just being OK. Every sound has an opportunity to create character and character development and, and tell more of the story. There was no feat actually recording the tracks, at least nothing that was very, very useful. So we had to add them. You could do the real sound of leather on what we think is concrete. It didn't sound right. So the next idea was to put leather on wood. It didn't work. So the only thing that really sold the idea of, of a very forceful person and a strong personality was feet on metal. Now don't look closely because there's no metal on that gangplank, but there is now because his feet now sound like a man who's in charge of a multinational corporation and that's what we wanted. So here's an example of feet being done a whole lot of ways, but only one of them was really right. Yeah, these are all feet right here. This is basically why we're employed to put sound in scenes like this. If we just used the production, it would, it would be a really good scene, but the uh, character development that we want to push is done entirely through sound. We're at Le Mans, and we're in the midst of the 24-hour race. Ken Miles has made an uh, unscheduled pit stop, and now he's racing to catch up. It was pretty important for us to get the actual GT40 sounds. Um, these are vintage cars, however almost impossible to find an actual vintage GT40 to record. But fortunately, 
we found a collector in Ohio who built a GT40 from genuine Ford parts with all the tailpipe and the engine sounds that we need. We then went to Ohio and on his local track, we recorded a couple days of recordings for this car and that's the hero car that we hear. And I've seen um, other GT40s, this is the real thing. The way they recorded the cars, there was microphones in the engine compartment, microphones in the cockpit on the transaxles and transmission to pick up different sounds. So it was very well recorded, as well as microphones all along the track. The cars are cut with a lot of separation, so I have complete control over the interior sounds, the exterior sounds. These are all the different microphones I had. So I was able to get in pretty tight with the car and balance between the different microphones and then spatially place them around the room. Like if we're in a shot that you see on screen, I'm keeping the engine with the car. When we're in the interior of the car, the engine sounds are all around us. So here's some of the car by itself. Sometimes when you're listening to the, these tracks by themselves and you hear the car engine and sometimes it sounds weak or soft, that's because there's a car skid there or the tire skid or a gear change that's filling that void or it's for music or it's for dialogue. Okay, so we're continuing on with the same scene, only this time we're gonna demonstrate some of the sounds in reverse order. Let's start with some of the crowds and then build up some of the sound effects until we finally have the full sound. So all of our crowds are in different languages as well as we have some PA announcers in French and English. So there's a whole atmosphere of Le, the Le Mans place itself. So when we cut back and forth from the race, we come to the, the stands, there's another world of sound. Music's driving, but it allows for the effects to play, and it really, really works well. And hats off to Marco Beltrami and Buck Sanders, because the score works so well with the, the way the sound effects can play. There's the cut to the speedometer. The guitars there are as big and powerful as any engine can be, and it, it is the GT40 musically right there. He's pushing the car too hard. That's not the plan. Let's change. It's almost as if the music is in the same key as the engine. I know Marco talked about that uh, and Buck, about crafting some of the music to go with the engine. I never really isolated that moment before, but now, now that I have, that's the same key. They're no dummies. Shelby, he's pushing the car too hard. That's not the plan. Let's change. Well, there's a lot of ways to make soundtracks. This is how we made ours. It's very subjective. It's, it's purely out of the mind of James Mangold. And so I want to thank Vanity Fair for letting Dave and me come and talk about our little film. And we hope you got a little insight. Uh, I know I did. Last thing. Oh my God, look at the time. Gotta go. <laughs> Bye now. Who wrote this?